Hey folks, this is Dat from Arise here. Today's video short is the first part of our three-part series on LLM evals. And what I really want to do is an educational recap on LLM evals. So we will cover, you know, what are they? How are they useful when developing and productionizing LLM applications? And what you should really know when using them. And so to really kick us off, when we think about the stack that you know, we likely work with, um, you're probably working with an LLM. Uh, you're likely working, you know, if you're doing RAG, maybe a vector database. Um, you might be orchestrating with a framework or maybe something custom. But really what we're going to cover um, is maybe under the observability kind of window. And so we'll talk a little bit about evals um, and why they're kind of important. And so evaluations or LLM evals are kind of um, one part of kind of how to think about evaluating you know, the entire LLM system. Um, and so you know, there's many different ways to maybe quantify how healthy your LLM application is doing, whether it's you know, um, tracking, hey, how is my user's experience going? You know, that thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, you know, user feedback. Um, things like golden data sets, maybe curated data sets to see, you know, if these are examples of good versus bad, maybe if I change out parts of my system, like my prompt engineering or maybe the LLM model that I'm using, um, do these kind of use cases or, you know, you can think tests or examples, do they break or not break or do they kind of align with what you expect or maybe not? Um, of course, there's business metrics as well, measuring things that, you know, very applicable to um, the LLM application, you know, relative to the business. But today what we're really going to cover is LLM as a judge. And so maybe to illustrate what LLM as a judge really is. Um, so when we think about maybe an example of a RAG pipeline, right? So here we have an, an LLM. Uh, we might have some, you know, some input on one side and an output on the other. And let's say, you know, in RAG we have an input, which is maybe a user's query. Um, we might inject some relevant information. Uh, via you know a rag process via you know our vector store to help us answer you know that particular question or task, and so if you think about the input being you know a question and uh, some chunk of text to help me answer that question, and then the output being kind of the response, um, maybe something that I might measure is uh, for example um, what we call rag relevance, or in this case uh, maybe we have a retrieval step right there in that rag process pulling from the vector database and maybe we just want to measure hey does that chunk that we return to answer that question for example does it answer you know the you know is it relevant to the question being asked or is it kind of not so for example here if we think about it from a tracing view uh, maybe we have a retrieval span and maybe we run the you know retrieval eval on that span and so what a prompt might look like might be you know, so it will say, hey, you're comparing a reference text to a question and trying to determine if the reference text contains information relevant to answering the question. Um, and then you'll say, like, here's the particular query. You'll kind of inject that. And you'll say, hey, here's the particular reference text. You'll inject that. And really, you're just going to say, hey, compare the above and, you know, give me a label on whether the, you know, the, the chunk was either relevant or maybe not relevant. And so the whole idea behind this is you actually get a label from the LLM as a judge process. Um, and this label you use kind of as a signal for, for you know, debugging or really understanding where parts of your system are, are behaving as expected or maybe not. And again, when we think about evals, um, that was just one example. There are many, many different types of evals out there. Um, some of the best LLM teams in the world, uh, they tend to not just use one eval, they actually tend to use a rubric depending on whatever application they're in or whatever context that they're in. And then they heavily customize as well. So um, you may notice a lot of folks, you know, um, will get started with out of the box evals, meaning um, it's like a you know, template that's already kind of been written. But really the best teams tend to really heavily customize what they define as maybe hallucination or what good code gen looks like or what frustration actually means in the context of an application. And so realizing that there are a lot of categories of LLM evals and really um, you know, new ones are always being created and they're always contextual to the application that you're in. And so 
when we think about maybe why LLM evals are really good indicators of uh, signal for a specific process, well, um, one, if you've defined them and you've kind of decided, hey, this is the rubric that's important, that's maybe one reason. But when we think about the actual task of running an eval, for example, if I asked you, the user, let's say we're doing a summarization on some text, and I ask you, the user, hey, generate me a really good summary on a very long, complex thing. Let's call it a book, uh, War and Peace, for example. Um, versus if I also, you know, if I asked you to, you know, give me kind of, uh, if I presented you a summary and I told you, hey, is this a good or a bad, you know, summary of the book War and Peace? Cognitively, when you think about it, it's much harder to do the first task than it is the second task. So the idea is that when we think about LM as a judge, it's not the same thing as the first task. So some people will wonder, well, if it hallucinated once, can it hallucinate twice? Well, the answer is that's always possible, but the reality of it is that it's also a very different task. And the second task, um, the LM as a judge task, is cognitively not, not as hard. Uh, and so this is why they tend to be good indicators, because uh, LLMs are actually fairly good at picking up you know, when a mistake has happened, because it's just an easier cognitive task than actually producing maybe the original task. And so um, maybe one thing uh, I'll talk about is maybe things, kind of best practices, and maybe what not to do. Uh, I think one thing that we've seen kind of from our experience is that using numeric, like continuously numeric uh, evals or um, kind of scores or propensities are not always ideal. And so we put out a little bit of research. Uh, I'm going to pull up um, some of the research that we, we posted. This is a part of us, um, you know, uh, X post um, about LLM as a judge, you know, when we use them in the context of continuous scores. Um, but the main idea is that, let me just show an example of this. Um, I'll just pull this one up. So the main idea is this experiment that we ran was, you know, for example, we'll do the spelling corru corruption. So we had a data set in which we, you know, um, iterated over 100 times where the number of spelling mistakes went from zero spelling mistakes all the way to 100% spelling mistakes. So number of words, um, we kind of did that all the way through uh, for 0, 10, 20, 50. You know, 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, et cetera. And so the idea is like you would expect, and we also used LM as a judge to say, hey, if there are zero spelling mistakes, you know, give me a zero. If there are, you know, if everything's misspelled, give me 100%. And so you would expect a perfect linear range here, right? If, you know, you kind of iterated through and we curated a data set that was, you know, 10% of words were misspelled, 20, 30. And so at the 10% mark, you would expect their, you know, that judge, that LLM score to be, you know, uh, one, for instance, and 20% at two. But what we notice is that's not true. And we ran this with many different tests. And I think we know this, but LLMs are not particularly good at math. And so the real issue here is that LLM as a judge, when you use it as a propensity or continuous score, they're not very consistent. And in the long term, you, you know, one, it just really mucks up kind of the signal that you're really after. And LLMs are obviously very good at words and, and languages. So this is why that label is, is so sotly kind of used. Um, and so this makes it important when you use that label because maybe you want to do things like, um, you know, collect a set of data points or, you know, uh, in this case, we're looking at some traces that maybe look like a specific uh, LLM as a judge. So maybe I wanna look at things that maybe hallucinated. And so maybe I can add that filter and see, you know, oh, these are all my hallucinated um, LLM as a judge on my traces. Uh, and maybe I can discern a pattern from collecting up all those traces and try to really dig in and see, oh, why did I get, um, you know, a particular hallucinated? Maybe I wanna figure out the why. Um, but the idea is like if you tried doing that with maybe propensity scores, since they're inconsistent, the things that you would collect wouldn't really, they would also not be consistent as well. Um, so uh, just wanted to do a little kind of educational recap on um, LLM as a judge and maybe why, um, you know, they're used and maybe how people, you know, use them kind of in the wild today. Um, so I hope you enjoyed, you know, part one of this three-part series on LLM evals. Be on the lookout for part two on how to run evals, um, and then part three, which is about inline evals. So thank you so much for the time, uh, and have a good one.